Hello and good afternoon to everyone. So today's session relates to banking, perspectives on a new era of banking. The banking landscape is ever-changing. We speak about digital transformation, shifting consumer expectations, inflation, low or zero interest rates. Of course, there's COVID and regulation, which must be high on most banks' agenda. And I mean, our question is, are we seeing a revolution amidst a steady evolution? How are local banks responding? And of course, there are other local challenges to deal with. And what is the vision of, of our banks um, on the ground here in terms of the future? With me today, um, I'm delighted to have um, an experienced panel of bankers um, and one regulator. So there's David Ecott, who's head of um, banking supervision at the MFSA, um, together with um, three experienced uh, banking professionals who definitely no, need no introduction. So Rick Hankin, CEO of Bank of Valletta and chairman um, of the Malta Bankers Association, Marcel Cassa, CEO of APS and Rick's predecessor at the MBA, together with Joyce Grek from HSBC, who is the head of commercial banking there. So thanks to uh, my fellow panelists for joining. And we'd like to kick off with a short um, presentation on the matter by Rick. So Rick, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ronald and, uh, and Joe for inviting me. Uh, I saw the emphasis on short there, Ronald, so I'll, I'll do my best to uh, keep it that way. Uh, and for that reason, I've just kind of prepared a, a few slides to put up in the background while I speak, which Peter will put up for me. Um, uh, hopefully this will help me uh, keep to time. Uh, a subject as broad as this, we could keep going forever. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of highlights that really Ronald's already, uh, already mentioned. So uh, on to the first slide. Um, I started in banking in 1980. And I walked into a room that looked like the one on the left. Uh, it's not actually the one because that's closed like many branches, but it really did look exactly like that. Um, what we're seeing is uh, increasing modernization, uh, far less secure because there's less cash in branches, more automation, more open and more customer friendly. Uh, and increasingly we're seeing a move to uh, uh, truly digital where people are banking remotely on their own or even in branches, services delivered by uh, technological means. Uh, on to the next uh, slide. Um, so what's driving uh, all, all of the change? Uh, the technology, um, everywhere you look, and if you Google uh, changing in banking, it talks about digitalization uh, and technological change. But what that's driving is a reduction in branches because less people feel the need to go into branches. Uh, now, it's different uh, uh, according to geographies, um, but Malta is still seen as the cash capital, says the European Bank. Um, in Sweden, for example, they're uh, virtually cashless. Uh, in the UK, uh, it's come down dramatically uh, from 60% to uh, under 40% now. Uh, in fact, near a 30% now, and they reckon it's reaching 21% uh, by 2016, uh, 2026. Uh, check usage has come down uh, significantly as well. But again, Malta lags uh, in, in terms of uh, broader EU communities. Um, it, it's as low as 1.2% uh, uh, across the whole euro area, uh, but Malta's checks yeah, usage is still quite high. Uh, and point of sale payments have been uh, significantly increasing, uh, more so in other parts of the, uh, of the Eurozone. What, what this is doing is taking away from the traditional branch-based cash and check uh, type of environment. On to the next slide. And um, technology um, is at the heart of all of this. Um, new players are coming in with a brand new uh, set of capabilities. Uh, with, uh, without the legacy systems that banks had, uh, they're able to move very swiftly to create much better look and feel. And that's putting uh, pressure on the traditional banks to expand. So banks that have built their whole uh, banking systems integrated on a core platform um, uh, with payments capability, that has now got to be uh, developed out into a much broader omni-channel type approach that delivers uh, services to uh, both business and personal customers in ways that are, are much easier from them uh, and technologically uh, driven. Now that is also driving a need for banks to bring in additional skills and capabilities. Um, uh, new uh, advances in technology require new skills, cloud computing, uh, massive increases in the uh, use of data, web 
uh, building capabilities. All of this is changing the way uh, in which bank operate and the staff, the, the type of staff skills they need uh, to operate uh, and the control uh, environment. You know, uh, IT security, cyber threats have, have got to be dealt with. On to the next slide, Ronald mentioned uh, regulators um, and they really are um, a driving change. Uh, uh, quite often bankers will moan about the uh, degree of regulation. I, I think it is all absolutely coming from the right space, which is uh, firstly to make banks more resilient. Uh, we saw the boom and bust cycles of the last uh, 30, 40 years, um, uh, yeah, an environment where banks created some of the problems because they weren't robust enough. So the drive to make sure that banks are more resilient is seen uh, in this increasing stack chart where the different types uh, of regulatory capital required on banks uh, has taken the position from uh, the historic levels of, of 8%, uh, you know, up to levels of 14% uh, as a basic set of requirements. But over and above this, banks have um, loadings for it, uh, themselves as well. So there'll be particular overlays specific to banks. So banks' requirements have more or less doubled, uh, capital requirements have more or less doubled in the last, uh, uh, in the last uh, 10 or 20 years or so. And that comes with other costs as well, because capital is costly. Um, shareholders uh, demand a return, which is something I'll come back to. Um, and, and capital has a cost of acquiring and maintaining. But banks have also uh, been expected to really raise the standards of governance of risk, compliance, IT security, and new areas like modeling uh, uh, and data analysis type of, uh, type of capabilities. So what's it doing to bank profits? Um, bank, next slide, Peter, sorry. Um, uh, bank profits historically, and unfortunately I only managed to go back to 2007 when I was pulling this together, but historically banks had um, a return on equity uh, north of 20%. Uh, in the last 13, 15 years or so, what we've seen is A, banks go through uh, some cycles, but as it's normalised over the last uh, eight to 10 years, what we're seeing is that banks have return on equity down in single figures. Um, now, this is driven by uh, a, a couple of things. Banks have had to de-risk. They've had to take out riskier areas of their business, and we saw this in many parts of Europe with banks moving away from investment banking uh, type of areas or, or putting extra controls into investment banking. Uh, but those that were generating high risk, high returns have meant the banks have pulled away from those. And if you think about your investment theory, uh, um, uh, listed stocks will have a beta factor. And the higher the beta factor, the higher the risk, and therefore the higher the expected return. What we've seen it is that banks have been reducing their beta, the volatility over the long term, which has reduced their return. So banks have moved down that risk reward trade off and at the moment are trending uh, towards a, a long run outlook of single figure uh, returns on equity. I don't think we're likely to get back, uh, certainly for the major banks, uh, into worlds of um, uh, uh, significant super profits and uh, uh, talk of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, taxing banks excessively uh, as they make windfall profits. Uh, I, I think those days are uh, pretty much moved on. On the next slide, um, what we've got is a situation where le lower profits are making it difficult for banks to balance the requirements of all the stakeholders. Um, uh, so shareholders, um, particularly here in Malta and uh, speaking for my bank, there's a, there was an expectation for many years that BOV would be a cash income uh, in terms of dividends paid over um, a, a regular period. So um, uh, shareholders will need to look at the returns that are coming out of the banking sectors more generally um, and manage their expectations in line with banks that have uh, potentially lower risk reward um, returns in, in the longer run. We've an increasing consumerist society. Um, uh, we've seen a lot of noise in the press over here in the last few months about bank fees. But the fact is, if you're a baker and the cost of your flour goes up, the cost of your bread goes up. Um, uh, and the reality is that banks are facing increasingly uh, higher costs uh, and are going to need to find some ways of, of offsetting these costs. Uh, the fintechs are changing consumer perceptions. 
banks are having to invest to keep pace with that. And the investment costs associated with um, uh, you know, radically changing and redesigning uh, quite historic organizations uh, is creating uh, pressure on the banks. Uh, depositors at the moment are facing uh, low interest rates, um, negative in, uh, in, in a more corporate world. And uh, the returns on, uh, on the bond market in the short duration uh, for quality are pretty much all negative. So whereas banks used to be able to rely on the fact that uh, they would make a bigger turn off of uh, the difference between lending and uh, deposit taking uh, um, and were able to adjust the margins between them, in a negative interest rate world where not all of that cost is being passed on to the depositors, the banks are being squeezed uh, even further. On to the next slide. Um, um, my last, you'll be virtually my last, you'll be pleased to hear. This is creating a number of dichotomies for banks. So banks are facing a, you know, I don't almost put a balloon in the middle of this and say that banks are being squeezed from all sides. Uh, th this isn't a poor little banker crying to the audience. It's trying to explain that there are many demands and being able to meet all of them is, is proving very difficult. Banks need to retain profit to um, meet the increase in capital requirements. And if they don't do that, it restricts the growth they can do in lending. And restricting lending growth means banks can't then generate more income for the future. So getting the balance right between how much profit is retained and how much dividends are paid out uh, is an increasingly difficult challenge. Uh, high cost branch networks. Um, we, I saw and I showed in the earlier slides that numbers of branches have been reducing significantly um, I, I'm not announcing any plans for BOV because we don't have such plans, but I can only see uh, branch networks continuing to reduce because premises, bricks and mortar are, are very expensive. Um, and the uh, alternatives of um, a direct service, self-service or low cost remote service uh, provides uh, real cost efficiencies. And banks need to balance that with the following point, which is the social needs. Uh, because different demographics have different requirements. Uh, the older population, and again, we see here in Malta, there is still a lot of people relying on cash. How long can banks keep meeting that social requirement for cash in one population of the sector and yet realistically address um, uh, the cost and, and, and profit, if, uh, profit issues? Uh, regulators and the world globally are focusing on environmental social governance issues, ESG, uh, and I've had to create a team within my bank that now focuses um, specifically on those uh, ESG factors. Uh, but we need to be very environmental orientated as we, uh, as we move forward, um, and uh, that will mean change in the ways in which we do things. Technologies can uh, help in that regard as well. And then finally, I've listed here just as examples, but uh, traditionally in banking, um, and I see it a lot here in, in, in Malta, it was a job for life. You joined, you become a generalist, you uh, get promoted, um, uh, maybe overgeneralizing, but on years of, based on years of service. There are no specialists that have, um, or few specialists that have emerged, and banks haven't been on the front foot in bringing in new skills and capabilities from outside that just have not been grown domestically uh, within the banking environment. So, and we've got to do all of that whilst meeting the increasing regulatory requirements. Uh, you know, I probably get three or 400 requests a month from the regulators for uh, information or action. It, it is an incredibly uh, costly uh, business to be uh, regulatory compliant. Uh, and we obviously need to make sure we're managing uh, the increasing risk profile uh, that banks see in this changing environment. So I just wanted to start that to lead the discussion into. So what will future banking look like? Uh, it's going to be every bank is going to play these dichotomies out differently. So no two banks are probably going to act and behave in the same way. Uh, they may have different stakeholder groups that are more important to them. Um, but balancing the needs means that banks are going to do things differently. My final slide, Peter, um, is uh, just a quote uh, that I saw used, uh, I won't claim the credit, but I saw used around the COVID situation quite recently. Um, it's not the end of COVID, it's not even the beginning of the end. Uh, and in banking, uh, what we're looking at here is the end of the beginning uh, and the start of a whole new world.
uh, Ronald. Uh, I, I hope that's given some flavor of uh, uh, how I'm seeing uh, the future of banking. Absolutely. And thank you very, very much, Rick. Thanks for kind of the candid, very down to it. And I think very relevant um, introduction to this discussion. I mean, we're pleased to have with us today kind of two, two panelists who are kind of Maltese born, bred, although I'm, 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 I'm sure and I do know um, both have spent considerable time working outside Malta and two people who have kind of recently, and it's all relative because I think both Rick and David have been on the island now for probably close to 18 months, but let's say lived for most of the life outside Malta. Um, can I start with a question to you, Rick? And again, thanks for the presentation. You've been in Malta for whatever, just over a year, 18 months. Um, could you, and I hope you don't mean, mind me asking, are the challenges which you see in Malta very different from the ones um, experienced in your previous role? Kind of different environment, smaller place, different context? Um, they're very idiosyncratic, if I can put it that way, and I, I, I'm uh, very uh, conscious of the need not to be seen as a foreigner, um, uh, uh, although I am and often called that as, as, as well. But um, the, the challenges here are no different to uh, what, what I've seen elsewhere. And, you know, I've worked in Asia, uh, New Zealand, Australia, so I've worked in many different uh, environments as well. Um, I think the challenges... Uh, here are, are a one of scale. So I've worked in organisations in the UK with 50,000 plus employees, um, and that's in a bank. So I talked about ESG, and I'm, I'm putting a team of two together. That's a stretch here in Malta. Uh, but in one of my previous big employers, they would have a team of 30 or 50 people focused on specific issues. Uh, so the, the scale issue is one that makes it difficult to get but the degree of specialism that's that's needed in, in some areas. Um, I, th I think also uh, Malta is an island. Um, it's um, uh, maybe been insulated from some of the change, um, but uh, when it was regulated locally, um, it, it kind of had historic patterns, but we've moved into, uh, and in my case, in HSBC's case, um, in particular, we get co-regulated by the European Central Bank as well as the MFSA here. And the European Central Bank are applying standards to what they call systemic banks, uh, banks that are important and could uh, impact the future of the economy in a, in a particular location. So the standards applied to um, Deutsche Bank or Royal Bank of Scotland or uh, you know, the big European banks are kind of being applied to a small bank here. With limited resources, it's difficult to manage all of those challenges uh, and I think we are somewhat behind here in Malta, to be perfectly blunt, uh, where the rest of Europe is and we're having to start to play catch up. And the last thing I'd say is the cultural, um, the cultural piece. Um, uh, it, it's, um, I, I think I've never seen a harder working population, uh, people with, with commitment and loyalty, that, those features are tremendous. Um, but culturally, um, I'm not getting a sense that um, I'm kind of going back 10 years or so in the UK, for example, some of the challenges we were facing back then I'm seeing here now um, and the cultural challenges that um, uh, the bigger banks and different economies had to go through. I see an element of catch up here today. Thank you, Rick. And thanks for the candid kind of answer, um, um, which is totally appreciated. David, I mean, you moved to Malta again recently. I, um, I'm not sure whether it was 12 months, 18 months ago, um, but possibly just a little bit after Rick. Um, and you come from the Bank of England. Um, from a regulatory point of view, um, would you be kind of be concerned of following the same um, areas or challenges which you would have been kind of at the forefront of uh, your mind on the UK? Uh, well, thank you and good evening. Yes, indeed, I've been here uh, uh, just over a year and made to feel very welcome, even though I am a regulator. So uh, thank you for that. Um, yes, uh, I mean, a number of the challenges that I see the, the, the banks face are indeed uh, similar to, to those which uh, uh, are prevalent in the UK and, and, and other jurisdictions. So um, 
a competitive environment out there um, uh, with all the factors that sort of Rick was uh, was talking about. Uh, a real focus on uh, cost management, um, uh, given the uh, the nature of the, the demand now to invest in IT, to acquire ex and retain experienced staff. Um, but it's that latter point that I think is uh, an interesting one in such a small market as Rick has just been talking about how you um, uh, how you focus on uh, retaining uh, quality uh, quality staff. That's one one of the interesting things here. I mean, I think in the uh, the in the UK um, there's been a longer history of focus on uh, on governance standards. If you think back to Capri review, Turner review, and things like that, that that really drove governance in fi the financial sector forward. And and I haven't quite seen that kind of sense of um, power behind the governance standards here. And the other area that I might just mention is. Uh, which probably leads on from what Rick was saying in terms of that sort of cultural shift. There was a real drive uh, in the UK. It hasn't necessarily been exactly the same in, in the US or Europe, um, uh, but a focus on culture within, uh, within banks. And uh, one of the sort of main questions that you would ask uh, the, the board and the, the chief executive are about uh, how they're delivering an appropriate culture. Uh, to attract the quality staff that they need to, but also to ensure that they're treating their customers in an appropriate way. Uh, and I think those are the sort of things that are probably going to come through the um, uh, through Malta as we uh, evolve our approach here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, and I take note kind of of your comment on evolution now. Um, um, and perhaps you, you've replicated some of, also of, of Rick's comments before in terms of culture, um, both positive and negative, I guess. Um, our next two panelists are uh, born in Malta. Let's put it this way. Um, Joyce, myself, um, you, 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 you've seen kind of you've been in the banking scene for a number of years now, and again we're in uh, 2021 now. What's on your mind in your very senior roles at your respective mind? Is it very different to what you would have experienced? I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, possibly even just five years ago. Um, Shall I go first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yes, I think, look, I've been involved in banking locally for a bit longer than 10, 15 years, but I, I wouldn't want to go there. Um, and looking back just over more recent history, I think the landscape has changed completely, as, as Rick has been saying. Um, and banking has become far more closely regulated. Rick has, has mentioned already the SSM, and I think that was the, one of the major changes and challenges I've lived through in the past few years. So when the SSM was introduced back in 2014 um, and the bank became uh, systemically important, there was a major shift. At the time, I was still chief risk officer, so I was kind of at, at the cold face um, and directly at the cold face. The demands brought about by that change are still felt and they've shaped the way we do things. So we've had to invest quite materially with, uh, with respect to the teams, to the people and the skills, um, reporting tools, etc. And it, all this to meet the demands of, of this uh, very demanding supervisory regime, with, which uh, Rick has already mentioned, is uh, there's no differentiation uh, between the smaller banks and, and larger banks. And by European standards, we're a very small bank. We're uh, just shy of a thousand employees now. So to build those skills um, is a challenge. Obviously we use a lot uh, uh, the, uh, the, the expertise that we have in other areas of the group. Um, the, the other thing that I've seen is, uh, is the changing consumer demand, um, both from personal and business customers, uh, where there is demand for more digital, which we've talked about, but I think it's really shaping uh, the industry. So there is more demand for digital rather than face-to-face. -face. When I look back, and just going back a couple of years, the share of digital and personal space has gone from under 80% in, in 2018 to now over 95%. So massive change there. And at the same time, obviously, teller transactions have dropped. So, it, and that's by about 60%, which is uh, massive when you consider the short period we're talking about. Um, and now we find that we're, we're not really the ones trying to drive customer behavior. 
um, we're investing and changing because we need to meet the changing demand. This is not just personal, even in the corporate space, where which is my area nowadays, um, we're seeing much heavier usage of our online platforms and demand for a broader range of services that can be obtained online, um, which is because of uh, the demand for easier interaction with us. So digital signing, online account opening, and all of this obviously requires investment um, and upgrades to our functionality and channel. So the, the bank is, uh, is being shaped by, by these things and it needs to, to respond. It needs to make investment decisions that uh, balance regulatory investment with uh, customer demand and customer need and service orientation investment. So that kind of in a few words were the, the major changes that I've seen personally. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you very much. Um, Marcel. Yeah, I think Rick and Joyce said it practically all. In fact, I was going to mute and uh, sit <laughs> back. But um, I can just articulate perhaps a bit more on, on what they were saying, because yes, these last 10 to 15 years, they've been, they've been exciting years. They've been interesting years. They were, by and large, um, the years after the 20, uh, 2008 crisis. And therefore, economies were rebounding, they were growing, they were becoming stronger, new technologies were uh, emerging, um, new markets were, were opening up. And all that was presenting banks with opportunities to grow and transform. And, and certainly Malta was no exception, as we know, Malta, the Maltese economy um, has been growing um, very, very strongly. But I think the challenges have been um, clearly um, spelled out, they increased. Um, so there's been a, a changing risk landscape, and uh, by risk, of course, we can spend hours elaborating where how that risk landscape was changing, including including cyber risk, um, more demanding regulation. And I think um, Rick um, uh, and even David briefly touched also on the uh, issue of proportionality. Um, technological change, we've mentioned that, and, and also the competition that, that it brought with it. And something which, which Rick also mentioned, and I think um, it needs emphasizing a lot because I, I feel it's, it's becoming a, a big issue for, for, for banks and for banks in Malta, that's the struggle to retain talent. Um, we're seeing um, enormous pressure, particularly in these times, as, as, the, as the labor market, especially in certain areas, um, is really becoming um, mad, crazy. Um, uh, and, um, you know, expats have, 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 have dried up because of various reasons, including COVID, difficulty with travel, relocating, etc. So um, the struggle to retain talent and to attract talent is becoming a serious one for banks. So all this was making the industry, you know, more dynamic, more complex and, and overall more ch challenging. And last but not least, I think I have to mention um, um, a very big challenge, which I'm sure we're going to discuss, um, which is that of reputation. Um, but but I, I think we'll leave that to later. Thank you, Marcel. And in fact, I was going to ask you kind of a next question, and I, I'm not sure kind of what your answer will be. Um, Rick is the current chair of the MBA. Um, I think immediately preceding Rick, you were the chair of the A of the MBA for a number of years. I think two or three years. I'm not sure exactly what the term what the term is. Um, you've just gone off gone off the, that role, but of course you retained your role as CEO of, a, of APS. Um, in your time as chair of the MBA, kind of taking a holistic view of the banking system in Malta, what was the main main issue on your mind at the time? <laughs> Reputation. Um, uh, it's, it's useless beating about the bush. It was reputation. And I have to say, um, um, reputation was on my mind, and I think it should have been on everyone's mind, um, uh, not only in recent years, but I should hope that it was for the past three decades, at least, since the financial services industry mode uh, um, started to develop, let's call it the modern era, the, the, the era since the 1990s, when Malta started its project. 
um, it, it was always um, at the heart, at the core of the project. I, I, I last year I wrote something for for the local press when when I uh, made reference to um, to an event in 1994 when the when the raft of new legislation and regulation was being launched. It was an event that was taking place in Gozo, so that was when all the you know investment services act, prevention of money laundering act, new banking act. New Companies Act, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was being launched. And I recall, uh, and I've said this a number of times, um, a particular appeal that was made on that occasion. There were many people present. There were many politicians present. Uh, there were regulators present, practitioners. And I still remember uh, an appeal that was made that, that Malta was a late comer to this business. And uh, it was going to have to compete with the likes of you know, Dublin, Luxembourg, the Channel Islands at the time, it was going to be tough. But there was only one particular ingredient which, um, which could help Malta to make it. And that was reputation. We had reputation all the time on our visiting cards, on everything that we do, on the way we position ourselves um, in the market. Um, um, we could succeed. And um, I think that um, Malta had very extensive and uh, sophisticated ambitions um, uh, at the time, which, which, it, which it started to realize because we started to modernize um, our legislative framework. Um, we, we started to develop a, a firm no-nonsense approach to regulation, um, um, but to, to, to regulation, but it was always based on reputation being um, our main visiting card. So I think it is with a certain uh, amount of uh, heavy heart and sadness and, and disappointment to see that, that a lot of the work that went into the project for, for many, many years, there were accidents, there were, there, were, there were incidents. And this is not a question of politics. It's not a question of one government or another government. I think, um, um, Mistakes happened um, a number of times over these over these thirty years, but it is a pity that um, reputation did not remain um, at the at the heart, at the core of the project, and um, um, a lot still needs to be done um, to uh, to put Malta back on the map as a as a as a jurisdiction that um, is at the center. Um, and should be at the center of financial services activity. So there is more that I'd like to say on this if there is the opportunity later, but it was definitely one of the main items on my mind and there were others, but definitely it was reputation. Uh, thank you, Marcel. And uh, perhaps a question to the bankers here. I mean, you mentioned reputation. Is there a direct impact on profitability in terms of costs of compliance, which might have escalated? Um... <laughs> Uh, Joyce, I'll come in if I may quickly. Yeah. Um, I, yes, I, I see direct costs on the bank as a result of Malta's reputation. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been um, covered in the press. We have struggled to maintain correspondent banking relationships. Um, I, I will not mention any names, but there is a bank that I was in discussions with at a very senior level, um, and uh, they they looked at Malta as a whole, and what uh, we may see uh, as a real business growth generator in gaming, this particular European bank said, um, we don't like gaming and we don't want to be associated with it. When I said, well, that's fine. Uh, I won't ask you to process payments on behalf of gaming companies. They said, no, no, this is just because you bank gaming companies. So uh, everyone has different opinions, um, but what we need to realize is that banks, big banks in other parts of Europe or America that we want to have relationships with to process payments internationally, um, they've got their own risk appetite and their own regulators to deal with. Um, so uh, I'm seeing an increasing level of workload and um, uh, challenge and effort to maintain relationships and probably increase pricing as a direct result of the fact um, that they are nervous, their own compliance costs increase and they pass those costs on to us. Uh, one last thing, Marcel, sure. on reputation. Uh, I came here 18 months ago, as you said. Uh, I probably started being interviewed for the role four or five months before. 
I Googled Malta. And if you Google Malta, all you see is the big headlines and adverse publicity relating to everything that went wrong two or three years ago, whenever it was, over the last five or ten years, maybe. But all of that is repeating itself in the press today. So even if Malta is sorting its act out, the reputational damage is continuing because that's the headlines you see if you look at Malta from outside. Sorry. Thank you, Rick. Um, and I'd invite again um, other panelists to share their views here. May I just remind um, people joining us um, uh, joining us remotely, please put your Q&A in the Q&A tab, um, not in the chat. So I'll be able to pick them up from there. So thank you. Marcel, Joyce, any, any more comments on this? And uh, I mean, I, I can just add another couple of comments, maybe rather than just complain about the issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can suggest what, what should be done. I, I think we, we all know what should be done. But there used to be a time where we actually used to promote Malta as a serious jurisdiction, as a jurisdiction that um, um, employs um, serious regulation and supervision. Friendly, it doesn't need to be promoted as being hostile, and friendly in, it, in its approach, in the, same, in the sense that the, the regulator is, is friendly, is, 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 is receptive, is, is responsive, but serious and no nonsense. I think a lot has been done. I, 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 we have David here on, on the call, and, uh, and I, I think we should commend um, a lot of the good work that has been done, especially in these last um, 12 months, and um, particularly in his area, but also in other areas, as MFSA. But the tone must return um, uh, across all segments of the financial uh, services industry. And the, and the tagline for promoting Malta, and this is also an appeal, for example, to finance Malta, to the authorities, to, 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 to government, the tagline must return promoting Malta on the basis of reputation. Um, it, 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 should, it should also be in the sense of our regulators are independent. They are not subject to political influence. They are truly independent. It's not just being independent on, on paper. They are independent and protected from all kinds of you know, pressure um, uh, because there are competent people and they can do their job. They, I'm sure they can do their job. Um, and it, it, it has to be pervasive. It has to go all the way through the way appointments are made to regulatory authorities, the way appointments are made on, on, on bodies, even bodies that promote, promote Malta. So the tagline, the, 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 the slogan has to come back to be Malta is a no-nonsense regulation. We are friendly, we are responsive, we are available, but we are, um, our, 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 our unique selling proposition is reputation. And I think what I would add to that as well is, is that within the, our organizations as banks, it's not just a matter of implementing the processes and policies and all that. It's also changing the culture. And that is perhaps the most difficult one. And it's one that we've, uh, we've, we've worked a lot on, but you have to invest a lot in that because it's ongoing training, ongoing uh, discussion about why this is important and why you take the steps that you take and who is this for. Um, who does this protect at the end of the day? But th just driving that cultural change, I think, is is perhaps not as tangible. It's not something that you tick a box. Um, so it's it's that much more difficult to get. Um, if I if I could just perhaps add uh, two two comments. I mean, the first, obviously, to echo uh, Rick's uh, comments from earlier, uh, having come from outside. I mean, uh, I've I've seen within my organisation a very dedicated, hardworking and talented workforce who are, who are working hard to, um, to, to improve uh, Malta's reputation. Um, and, and I know that within the banking community, there are uh, people are doing exactly the, uh, exactly the same. Um, that isn't going to waste, but um, given where we have come from, uh, I don't think being good enough is going to be good enough we're going to have to go further. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I wrote recently uh, an article where I sort of said, you know, we're all going to have to redouble our efforts. But I mean, uh, it's true. We, you know, each, each time we think we've made a step forward, um, that isn't going to be good enough. We're going to have to keep going at this.
thank you very much, David. And again, I mean, conscious of the time, because we could probably keep on kind of going on and dis dis discussing the meta here. But again, conscious even of the of the subject and some questions coming in um, through through the through the Q and A. Um, I'll go back kind of to 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 the to the to the topic of the, for 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 this debate, and I'll pick up three three topics: digital transformation zero interest and COVID. And again, I'm relating to some questions which are coming through the Q&A. If we take these three, um, three, three matters, which of these would you think is the main issue on, mind, on your mind? So just focusing the challenge of the digital transformation, the fact that kind of we're living in a zero interest environment, and finally kind of emerging out of COVID. Rick, Joyce, Marcel, I, well, to simple answer is all three. <laughs> um, in terms of priority, uh, clearly COVID uh, is exercising us all on a day-to-day a -day basis today. Um, digital transformation um, uh, is a hugely costly uh, digital. Um, uh, Digitalisation is a phrase you often hear uh, banded around. Uh, the reality is, I, I like to think about just the simplicity of it. What are we really trying to do? We're trying to take processes that are difficult, customer unfriendly and manually intensive and turn them into simple processes that are easy for people to use in whatever means uh, they take. Uh, I think that journey is something that uh, different banks in Malta I've seen are already at different stages of advancement, but we are all going to have to stay uh, focused on uh, for a number of years to come. Uh, and the change will not um, abate uh, you know, you can't sit back and say, I've done it in six months time. This is a five to 10 year ongoing journey. And then there'll be something new uh, completely again crops up, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, the zero interest rate environment, I, I'll probably hold judgment a bit on, but it is creating a massive squeeze on banks. And at the same time, consumers are not able to get um, uh, returns on interest in the way that they were. Um, uh, you know, pensioners who might uh, have investments tied in uh, nearer cash type investments as well, they're not paying the types of returns. So it will hurt uh, the low interest rates, not just hurting banks, but it's hurting those who traditionally have relied on some kind of interest return. Yeah, and I think COVID has brought a different spin to everything, hasn't it? Because when you look at technological advancements and uh, investments in new technologies and all that, because of COVID, we've had to do that. You know, we, we're on Zoom. We would never have done this before, webinars and people working from home and all that. So we've had to invest and adapt and uh, change the way that we interact with our customers and enable more customer sign, uh, document signing with uh, electronically uh, and exchange of documentation and, and all that by uh, electronically. So COVID really has brought a different spin. But I think when, when you look at what we're facing now, um, COVID with the uncertainties that is brought to the economy and the challenges and the fact that companies have had to borrow more in order to make up for the loss of business and at many times actual losses that they've incurred in the past year or so. I mean, they'll be more highly leveraged, so that will impact their capacity and capability to borrow more in future in order to invest. So I think the effects of, of COVID will be felt for quite some time. So in the same way that we still talk about the financial crisis um, more than 10 years on, I think we'll be talking about COVID long after the, the virus is gone, if it ever leaves. Um, hopefully it does. But yeah, I think COVID is going to have so many impacts for quite a bit of time. Thank you, Joyce. Marcel, any, any, anything you'd like to share? I'm conscious I'm, I've left you for the end again. I'm sorry about that. You're on mute, Marcel. Yeah, conscious of time. I, I think all three are critical, important, but if I were to look at, you know, cliff effects and uh, what's most um, imminent, what's most critical, it's definitely COVID. If we, we were just to look at the fact that um, moratoria were due to start expiring uh, very, very soon, there, there will be extensions, um, but the, but the impl implications and the, and, the, and the considerations around the medium to long term effects of COVID should be on all our minds. So I would put COVID, but all the others, of course, are, are, are equally critical. Okay. Ronald, just yeah, to yeah, reinforce, 
just to reinforce what Joyce said, I, I totally agree with Joyce. The, the uh, COVID situation has accelerated the technology uh, and very quickly, a, a little ditty, but um, 15 years or more ago, I remember piloting in a branch, a video booth so that customers could come in and talk to a, a customer service agent remotely. It was rejected out of hand. How on earth could anybody deal with a person over the internet um, it was kind of the approach back then. You look at where we are now and it's changing mindsets and behaviours. I totally agree with Joyce. I've just seen a Q&A or a comment coming in, which I think is very relevant. Um, someone is saying, why not? Why waste a good crisis? Because I mean, with all the negativities of, of COVID, could this be an opportunity to accelerate digital transformation? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Even the home working piece, I mean, uh, the way we organize ourselves, I mean, we, uh, at one point, m more than 90% of my team were working from home, and there was no impact on customer service. Uh, it's, uh, and we've realized that we can do things different. Um, you don't waste time traveling and, uh, you know, you're comfortable at your own home. And as long as the technology works, and, and there's so much technology, and we use only a very small uh, part of the functionality of the technology that we have. I totally agree. I think it's absolutely needed. What this has done is given uh, an impetus and acceleration to stuff that uh, may have taken longer otherwise. Yeah, and, I, I agree. Sorry, I mean, the, the the authorities are sort of moving as well in that direction, and uh, and the, the the move towards more sort of digital or online payments from from government and things like that are are improving. Um, and uh, and indeed, as a regulator, I mean, uh, you know, we're we're trying to uh, make more use of uh, digital technology as well to make the way in which we work more effective, more efficient, and uh, uh, and hopefully uh, that also improves uh, over the uh, over the time as well. Thank you, David. Thank you. I mean, perhaps a question to to um, uh, the, the people at the banks on, on um, um, in the panel here. I mean, there was some reference to crypto, and I'm seeing it kind of in coming in into the one of the Q and days. Um, how much is it on your mind? Perhaps starting with you, Marcel, not to leave you for, for the end again. No, I think um, crypto is crypto is just one um, aspect of the of the story. Um, uh, we need to talk about money first. So, money, whether it's conventional or crypto. Um, um, needs payment systems in order to flow. Um, so the currency is the what, while the payment technology is, is the how, but they're not one and the same. So um, the questions about crypto, um, where they, um, will they be accepted as a store of value? How will they be regulated? Um, will they become legal tender? Um, um, they are still an area of um, very high risk because of their uh, propensity to be used as a medium um, of money laundering. Um, but I think there is nothing at this point in time that is suggesting um, that banks should be changing, or at least maybe I speak from, from, from the local angle, should be changing their business models or, uh, because of crypto. But what, what it means, for banks is that the traditional role as, a, as the main or the, 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 the principal payment intermediary for, for funds and, and currency transactions um, is becoming challenged and is changing. And, and that's what crypto is doing. Otherwise, it, I can't say that it is um, particularly on our radar um, uh, apart from, from, from what I've just mentioned. You're on mute, uh, Ronald. My, my apologies. Um, thank you, David. Um, anything anyone would like to add here? Um, well, perhaps I can. Uh, I can say something. I, I mean, the uh, as a sort of a policy level, the uh, the European Commission is starting to look at um, where cryptocurrencies will fit into the sort of future digitization of. Uh, uh, of, of financial services, um, and and to and, and Malta has done some work already to ensure that it's getting a bit of a skill set and understanding of this um, through uh, through the work that the MFSA has done 
done previously. But if if we do go down this route and it comes into banking in a in a bigger way, I mean the uh, the issues for banks and for regulators will um, become more complicated exponentially, even from what we've already discussed is a very uh, very complicated. Uh, point that we've already arrived at in terms of regulation, because how you value balance sheets and set capital and liquidity requirements in an environment where the currency actually changes value um, itself, and, and ensuring uh, appropriate governance over that kind of stuff would be uh, would be very complicated. So I think you know we we have to engage positively uh, with the uh, with the sort of um, the agenda that's emerging uh, in Brussels. Um, uh, and but nevertheless, be um, be very cognizant of uh, of the risks that they, that you know bringing these these sectors together is going to uh, uh, going to sort of create for us. Thank, thank you, David. And again, conscious of the time, I'll jump onto something else. And quite a few interesting questions coming in, which I'll try to kind of put together. Um, Manival, we hear a lot about Manival, and again, it's been in the news over the last few days. How important is the outcome? and any implications of the exercise on your business. And perhaps I'll channel this to the current, the incumbent and previous MBA president. Uh, uh, money value is incredibly important. Uh, A, because it goes to the heart of the reputational issue that Marcel quite rightly highlights. Um, B, because it has a direct impact uh, and I, again, I'll. I'm not giving state secrets away here, but uh, within my organization, I've had um, a number of meetings, as you might imagine, with some uh, very big banks in America. Uh, a couple of them have already offered to act as a correspondent bank for BOV, only when we get clearance from MoneyVal. So, um, uh, you know, it is uh, very directly related to, uh, uh, to business impact. Thanks, Rick. Undoubtedly, I, <laughs> I expressed myself already on this, and um, I, I think the focus on Manival and its outcome, which is now um, awaited, we, we, we are informed that it is sort of a matter of days, maybe weeks, but possibly days. Um, let's not forget that Manival was not the only, um, let's say, protagonist in the story. There was also um, the IMF Financial System Stability Assessment um, before that, which in, I think, was it 2018 or 2019, had already highlighted certain issues um, with regard to Malta's AML and uh, CFT um, regulation and enforcement. So that high, high risk stamp on Malta um, has only been reinforced by, by many well. So. Uh, the, the load of risk and negative sentiment about um, uh, Malta's reputation have unfortunately outshined um, a lot of the progress made. And therefore, I think it is imperative and, uh, and, and important the, 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 the outcome of a positive Manival um, um, uh, result is, is critical, not just for banks and for the financial services industry, but also for other industries that are um, um, very much dependent on the on, on, on financial services. I mean, we look at you know hotels, accommodation, um, events. They're already getting a battering because of COVID. Um, the last thing we want is that once there is a rebound and there is light at the end of the tunnel, um, uh, the industry gets further um, you know loaded down because of because of. Uh, uh, a downturn in the in the in the industry because of because of negative money value um, outcome. Um, I, I would just say that uh, I mean it is uh, obviously very important and it's one of the hurdles and one of the higher hurdles that we we do need to get over. But we won't be able to stop if the outcome is good for us. We there is a, still a lot to do beyond money value. Um, uh, and so uh, we will we will need to continue to uh, to address the uh, the points that we've been we we have been making and or have been doing since uh, since that assessment um, uh, was in frame. Thank you, David. Thank thank you very much for that. Um, there's an, another question which has come in through kind of the panel. If you could change one thing in your bank or organisation, um, or perhaps continue working on. To leap forward, what would that be? Uh, 
or perhaps not change. Um, um, let's say um, accelerate or push push the accelerator button on. Yeah, I think I think the investment in technology. Okay. I think that's that's always an, an issue. And when you have your your platforms which are existing and which have been kind of created over the years, and then you've had to adapt and kind of tack onto them. Um, so if if I could change, it would have been much easier to build everything from scratch, which is where uh, perhaps some of the uh, payment providers that that come in. Uh, which which are more technology based have have an edge. Um, so it, I think banks, you need to become more more. We need to become more adaptable and perhaps even even uh, work with fintech companies going forward so that we adapt uh, some technology and buy it in rather than seek to adapt our existing. Because when when you have your legacy um, infrastructure and then try to build on that, then it, it does hamper you a bit. So perhaps that's what I would change. Thank you, Joyce. I, I join with Joyce because I think technology accelerating the, the rate at which we can deploy it would be high up my list. Um, uh, the other thing I, I, I'd say um, is I see some great people. Um, I, I know how hardworking they are, but there is a portion of my workforce that are incredibly worried about change. So what I would like to see and help those people get to is to understand why that change is necessary to embrace it and, and, and uh, join it. Uh, you know, I'm using a phrase internally within BOV, we've got a strategy bus. We're gonna take the bank in a whole new different direction. Uh, I want people to get on that bus and help us shape the direction. I don't want them stood outside throwing stones, but whatever they do, they shouldn't stand in front of the bus because it's going to move. Next, Rick. Thank you. I like the way you put it. I, mean, I, I agree. I mean, data, quality of data and ensuring that we've got good um, reporting will be will be key. I mean, uh, that helps us uh, sort of or inform strategy setting, doesn't it? And where we are in terms of strategies, both individually, but also for the jurisdiction. Um, and then coming back to the, the point we made earlier about uh, ensuring uh, ensuring our staff are uh, feel valued and uh, and and progress within their careers because this is also about uh, making sure that we've got a vibrant industry. Time for training and development and uh, uh, would be uh, would be uh, one of the other things that you'd you'd probably want to prioritize to address some of the issues we talked about. Thank you, David. One final question. I know there are two minutes left. One final question for all the panelists here. Um, can the banking community service the business community better? And how can both communities um, step up? Joyce? Okay, I'll, I'll go first and, and I'll be brief. So the, the way I think that the business community needs to step up a bit is to improve its governance. So um, what I mean there, and, and something that I've seen improvements in, so companies having boards with, uh, with external parties on the boards, with diversity in all its forms on the board, so that to get better decision making. I think that's really important and something we'd like to see more of, um, and how we can uh, help the community better, as it were. I think it's, it's looking at the way that business is going. For example, uh, Rick mentioned the SG. There, there's a, a big change coming um, and companies need to adapt to that. So by supporting them throughout that change, that transition, I think that's what we, we need to kind of add more value to, to our customers than, than we've been traditionally doing. Thank you, Joyce. David, from a regulatory point of view, from the regulator's point of view, rather? Uh, well, so, um, so, so Joyce is right. There, there are ways in which um, the business community could help themselves in terms of actually their relationships with the banks, um, transparency and, uh, uh, is, is one of them. Um, and, and yes, indeed, ESG, I mean, we shouldn't let the sort of the, a future of banking um, uh, seminar go by without mentioning the impact of climate change and things like that are going to have on, uh, on, the, on these businesses and being proactive in that space as a business. 
uh, will uh, will also help your relationship with the bank. I think there are things that the uh, the banks could do as well. I mean, um, uh, having a good quality relationship with the client based on uh, quality communication is uh, is important. And are, is there enough understanding created at the moment? My sense when I talk to some businesses uh, here in Malta is not, and there's quite a lot of focus on you know the cost of you know, sort of interchange fees and and, and transactions. So uh, and and perhaps not the level of understanding about how the bank's relationship and the charging structures interact. So uh, so I suspect there's 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 transparency on both sides that could probably um, uh, probably help. Thank you very much, David. Marcel, Rick, if you could go briefly, just a couple of words. Uh, from my side, I agree with what's uh, what, what's just been said. Uh, there is no doubt um, what I have experienced in the last year. Uh, uh, some banks, and I'm particularly looking uh, at my own here, have failed to serve customers as well as we should. And we need to get a lot better at that. But I think the business side of things are quite often going, you bank sort it out, whereas a shared responsibility and understanding will help that. Thank you, Rick. Marcel? Yep, and that would have been my, my reply to the previous question. One thing I would change is trying to become all, always more, you know, customer passionate, customer responsive, because ultimately the customer is, is right. Um, there's a lot that our customers should change. Joyce mentioned governance, um, better financial discipline, financial management, reporting, um, in general, I, I would say the way um, organizations, businesses, even small businesses are governed and most that there is room for improvement, um, but we have a role to play as well. So um, um, we need to engage more with them. Um, uh, even when we decline onboarding, we need to be more um, friendly. We need to explain to the extent that's possible, of course, uh, why uh, a particular relationship cannot be entertained. So. Ultimately, this is our uh, customer base. This is, these are the people who pay our um, um, salaries, who pay our bills, and who pay uh, the dividends to our shareholders. Thank you, Marcel. We're two minutes over time. I really ap appreciate and thank kind of all the fellow panelists here. We could have gone on probably for another hour, and I'm seeing a lot of questions, which unfortunately we, we didn't have the time to address, but I tried to capture quite a few. So a big thanks to all of the people who kind of joined me on this webinar, and a big thanks to you, to all those people who are kind of viewing us remotely. Thank you, and look forward to the next MBN seminar. Thank you very much.